Have you ever felt like you're not living the life of your dreams, although you desperately want to? Have you ever felt that all or most of your friends are living a much more successful, happier life, while you're still struggling to settle down? Are you assailed by self-doubts and fear of criticism every time you think of pursuing your dreams? Hello everyone, and welcome to another brand new episode on my channel, Wonder Boho Book Club. Today I'll be summarizing the book, Girl, Wash Your Face, Stop Believing the Lies About Who You Are So You Can Become Who You Were Meant To Be, written by Rachel Hollis. Rachel is an American author, motivational speaker, and founder of a lifestyle website called thechicsite.com. Her self-help book, Girl, Wash Your Face, since its release in February 2018, has maintained a spot in the top 10 best-selling books in the country for seven months, held the top spot for 12 of those weeks, and has sold more than 3 million copies worldwide. In this book she has thrown light upon the common lies that women may face when they are trying to find their way in a masculine world. Written with blatant honesty and deadpan humor, Rachel cites examples from her personal life and explains the practical tactics she used to overcome the illusions that left her feeling overwhelmed and worthless. Throughout this book, she offers words of encouragement, motivation, and even a little kick in the butt, all with the intention to help you get real and become the joyful, self-assured woman you were destined to be. Part 1. The Lie, Something Else Will Make Me Happy When we surf social media, we are flooded with photos of people enjoying affluent lifestyles, and it may be difficult to prevent ourselves from feeling envy of these individuals and their lives. However, we need to realize that having a life that's always wonderful and devoid of any ups and downs, is a myth. Everyone, especially superstars, is susceptible to being affected by the highs and lows that are a natural part of life. Rachel gives an example from her personal life to drive the point home. Once, while jumping on the trampoline with her kids, she was painfully reminded by herself that her body had changed substantially since she had given birth to her three children. She no longer had the option of being able to exercise bladder control whenever she pleased. As she was fixing this bladder leaking accident, she uploaded photos on Facebook of herself trying out different dresses to wear at the Academy Awards, an event she was able to attend thanks to her husband's job. So. Although, on the surface, it seemed as though she lived a life of luxury, in reality, she was an aging woman and a mother of three, cleaning up her own urine while jumping on the trampoline. This was her moment of insight. She realized that the lives of other people, as shown on social media, are not necessarily truthful. In fact, social media is all about pretending to be happy and perfect at all times, but it's only a pretense. Rachel is well aware that her life is far from being perfect. She plays the role of a wife, a mother, a friend, and a boss, and just like every other human being on the globe, she is fallible in each of these roles. There is no such thing as perfection, but because we live in a culture that drives us crazy with its incessant criticism and constant reminding us that we're not good enough, we have a propensity to be too critical of ourselves and to give ourselves a hard time when we compare ourselves to other people. Having gone down the rabbit hole herself, she now realizes that the two most crucial aspects of accomplishing one's objectives are having a proactive attitude, and accepting responsibility for one's actions. If there is anything in your life that is making you unhappy, you should not be afraid to make adjustments in your life. Those people who are happy are well aware of their shortcomings, but they also take responsibility for themselves, and try to better the areas in which they fall short. Having said that, it's not like Rachel's life has always been flowery and rosy. She was born into a dysfunctional family, her parents having had a rocky relationship, and her brother committed suicide in the beginning of her freshman year of high school. 
All this affected her deeply on an emotional level, and she matured up much faster than the other youngsters of her age. When she turned 18, she uprooted her life, and traveled as far away from her hometown as she possibly could. But the fact that she was in a new location wasn't what made her happy. Rather, there were a lot of other aspects at play in her effort to find pleasure in Los Angeles. The very first thing that she did was to stop evaluating herself in terms of how she fared in comparison to other people. This was primarily because using the achievements and setbacks of others as a measuring stick didn't help her accurately gauge her own successes and failings. Instead, she opted for something very simple, she focused on being a little better each day than the previous day. Next, she made sure to save space in both her calendar and her heart for the interactions and connections that would bring her the greatest joy. Finally, she identified the aspects of her life that contributed to most of the happiness she experienced. This included getting away from people, things, or situations that made her feel uncomfortable or filled her with negativity. Part 2, The Lie, I'll Start Tomorrow. Are you someone who's in the habit of promising oneself that you'll begin your new habit the next day? In this chapter, Rachel talks about her own experience. She talks about the countless number of times she made the resolution to follow a diet, go to the gym, quit smoking, or cut down on drinking, or simply go for a walk in the morning, and how she went back on her words after just a few days. When it comes to her propensity to put things off until later, Rachel Hollis is no different from the rest of us ordinary people. If you're anything like her, you're always trying to persuade yourself that you're going to start a new activity, but you never end up doing it. The only way to escape this vicious cycle is to go for self-introspection. Once you set your heart upon doing something, do it. Usually, we don't break promises we make to others, so why break promises we make to ourselves? Here, Rachel tells of the time when she promised to herself that she'd run on a treadmill every day, no matter what. As a result, she kept the promise to herself and ran on the treadmill, even after having a late dinner with her friends. Although it bummed out her friends to see her photos on Snapchat, running on treadmill at such an ungodly hour, Rachel just couldn't go back on the commitment she'd made to herself. Let's look at the situation from another angle. What do you think of people who don't keep their word to others? Unreliable, untrustworthy, right? Now imagine your subconscious watching you make promises to yourself and break them, over and over again. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that your subconscious labels you as unreliable as well. The point is, you can't trick your subconscious, it knows when you're all talk and no action. According to the author, it's important for us to understand that as we practice keeping smaller promises to ourselves, eventually it becomes easier for us to keep bigger promises. Hence, we should start small and build up gradually. For example, instead of resolving to launch an intense workout session, we should start by performing a little jog every day. Also, once we realize the significance of keeping promises, we would make fewer commitments, giving our time and energy to only those things that bring us true joy and happiness. Part 3, The Lie, I'm Not Good Enough It is extremely common in today's society to constantly pit ourselves against each other. In fact, it has become our second nature, but this mindset can be detrimental to one's success. We are always living in self-doubt, fretting over our inadequacies and flaws in creating a perfect relationship, whether that means being a good enough mother, wife, sister, friend, or worker. What we should really do is celebrate our accomplishments, no matter how small or big they are. It could be something as trivial as doing the laundry, making the bed, or something significant as getting a promotion at work. Every time we tick off an item on our checklist, we should celebrate, or reward ourselves in some way. 
Pampering ourselves this way reminds us that we're good enough, and we deserve the best. The author further elaborates this point by giving examples from her personal life. Being the youngest child in the family, and having to witness her parents' contentious relationship with each other, she realized early on in her childhood that the only way for her to get attention was to do something extraordinary. So, throughout her school years, she concentrated on getting good grades, and later on in life, because her subconscious kept telling her that she has to keep proving herself, she became a workaholic. She pretended that drowning herself in work might save her from impending disasters, like a looming breakup. However, all she received in return was excessive stress, physical breakdown, a facial paralysis, and the breakup happened anyway. This made her realize that during the time that she spent working as a self-help guru, she violated one of the most fundamental guidelines that the industry has, which is that she did not take adequate care of herself. Fortunately, our bodies give us signals whenever we're on the verge of a breakdown, and it's our responsibility to pay heed to those signals. Upon being advised by the doctors to take complete rest, the author immersed herself in therapy, and started studying scripture, which helped her connect to her spiritual side, and brought her inner peace. She realized that sometimes she has to prioritize her own needs over those of others, and that those needs were more related to her inner peace and well-being, rather than the materialistic achievements she'd been running after for so long. She realized that, after all, if she isn't happy herself, she can't make anyone else happy either. Part 4, The Lie, I'm Better Than You Women have an innate tendency to constantly judge other women, most of the time on autopilot mode, be it judging a mother who's letting her child yell while in the supermarket, or judging a woman because of the way she's dressed. Sadly, the flaws that we see in other people are nothing but reflections of the flaws that others see in us, and let's face it, judging others doesn't make us feel any better about ourselves either. Rachel says that we need to realize that our thoughts and words carry more power than we imagine, hence we need to change our way of thinking, from critical to positive, and stop judging others. When we judge one another, even unconsciously, we demotivate the other person. Instead, we should be doing the exact opposite. We should focus on the positive aspects of each other and try to build each other up. This way, we'll all be motivated to put our best foot forward without fear of criticism or condemnation. Here, Rachel tells the story of when she was on a flight, and one of her co-passengers was a woman who was traveling with her horribly misbehaving child. Rachel felt irritated that the lady wasn't doing much to calm the child down, but later on she realized that it wasn't her place to judge the mother. For all she knew, there could be a million reasons as to why the child was behaving so badly. Instead of being harsh on the mother, Rachel felt that she should have let the mother know that it was okay even if her child was misbehaving, sometimes kids just don't listen, and that she was a good mother after all. Drawing from her experience as a lifestyle coach, Rachel says that women need just a few things to be happy, kinship, community, and interaction. But to achieve this, we need to keep a few things in mind. First, there is no one absolute way of doing anything, that is, your way may not be the only way. There could be a million ways to achieve something or arrive at a destination, as long as you enjoy the journey. Second, surround yourself with positive-minded people, who try to build you up rather than tear you down. Third, try to consciously reduce the negative chatter in your head. Try to find common ground and empathize. And last, don't be afraid to look inward and find the deep-rooted insecurities that cause you to judge and criticize others in the first place. Part 5, The Lie, Loving Him Is Enough For Me When we're young, falling in love can be the most exciting and wonderful sensation there can be. Rachel was no different. She fell in love at a young age, but with the wrong man. 
She was head over heels in love with the guy, and catered to his every whim, which reduced her to nothing more than his personal errand girl. She envisioned marrying this guy, but ultimately was left with a broken heart. She says she learned a very important lesson from this failed relationship. Never lose your self-respect and identity in a relationship. It's easy to lose ourselves in a relationship and prioritize the other person's needs more than ours, but this is not what a healthy relationship is about. The best way to understand this is to view the relationship from a third person's perspective. Get a listening ear. Talk to a friend or well-wisher about your relationship. The friend would be in a much better position to assess the relationship objectively and give you honest feedback. Also, watch out for signs that tell you that your relationship is turning abusive or exploitative. It's never too late to stand up for yourself and walk out of a toxic relationship. Part 6, The Lie, No is the final answer. You will undoubtedly face rejection at some point in your life, since it is an inevitable facet of the human experience. There will be a lot of people who question your capability to do anything, either because your goals are too lofty, or because you are too naive. It is very necessary for you to have a positive attitude at all times, even when confronted with challenges. A setback is an opportunity to grow from the lessons you've learned, and become a better version of yourself, so refrain from being so hard on yourself. When it comes to understanding the events that take place in our lives, each of us brings a unique collection of filters, biases, and lenses to the table. These things shape how we look at the world and how we interpret what we see. Consider the bright side of every situation and make it a point to consciously choose to do so. The first step is to sit down and think about what it is you want out of life. Write down your dreams and fears, even the ones you have been keeping to yourself, out of concern that you may fail or humiliate yourself in some way. Once you acknowledge your fears, you will be able to conquer them and go on with your life. Life is full of trials and tribulations. There will be times when you'll fall flat on your face. We all do. Get up, harden your resolve, and try again, giving your best shot every time. Achieving your dreams is the only way to be, because when you achieve your dreams, you are truly embodying who you are. If you fall short of doing so, you're not living the life that was meant for you, and are dead before you die. Ignore what the experts have to say, especially when they dissuade you from pursuing your goals. Be kind, but stay focused on the goals you set for yourself. Part 7, The Lies, I don't know how to be a mom, and I'm not a good mom. For most women, life takes a whole new turn when they give birth to a baby. Things become chaotic, unpredictable, hectic, and let's face it, it's not easy being a mom. On top of that, when you consider the media hype regarding the topic of motherhood, it's no wonder that new moms become gullible and scared that they're not good at being a mom. Giving birth brings about a plethora of physical and hormonal changes in a woman, and many women go through periods of resentment, dejection, and depression, when they become a mother. It's important not to compare oneself against the standards set by the media, and give your heart and soul into taking care of your baby. Also, don't forget to enjoy the small pleasures of motherhood, like seeing your baby smile or sleep, or simply hold its hand. It's easy for women to forget or forego their own needs, in order to take care of their family. It's important for us to realize that we can keep our family happy only if we feel happy ourselves. Hence, don't neglect your own needs. Take time off to relax, go to a spa, or an evening out with your friends. Also, don't try to be a perfect mother, because there's no such thing. We're all humans, and we all make mistakes. What matters is that we try our best. As your children grow up, life becomes even more chaotic. 
It's important to remember that you don't need to give up on your dreams just because you have responsibilities towards your children. Keep pursuing your heart's desire and try to give as much time to your kids as possible. Read them bedtime stories, play with them, and help them with their school homework. Part 8, The Lie, I Should Be Further Along By Now We are raised in a society where death is something to be feared. We're always racing against time, exhausting ourselves to achieve more, do more. Why? Well, the notion that time is slipping away as each year goes by and we haven't been able to accomplish everything we wanted, combined with the prospect of looming death, pushes us further down the rabbit hole. We all have milestones and bucket lists, and we measure our success by the number of things we can tick off on that list. What we don't realize is that life is full of surprises, and most of the time, the most amazing things that happen to us are not something we plan in advance. Life just happens. The author suggests that instead of feeling miserable about the things we haven't achieved, we should focus on the things we have achieved and celebrate our accomplishments. Rather than chasing phantoms, we should look more closely at the things we already have in our life and nurture, nourish, and develop it. We should be grateful for the little joys that life bestows upon us, whether it comes from our friends, family, or our jobs. Also, we should remember not to set unrealistic goals for ourselves, as not being able to achieve such goals often leads to disappointment. Part 9, The Lie, I Am Defined By My Weight it is easy to become fixated on one's physical appearance and weight in a culture that is preoccupied with social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. The vast majority of women are self-conscious about some or other aspect of their appearance, but you can't let your weight be the only thing that defines you. You are more than just the sum of your parts, including your weight. Always keep in mind that the physical vessel you inhabit is a gift, and always treat it as such. The only way to truly love and appreciate your body is to take care of it, and maintain its health in the best possible way. All you need to do is to figure out an exercise routine and a diet that works for you, and you have to fight the urge to eat whenever you are feeling down. Maintaining your health and well-being does not require you to be flawless or thin. Also, you don't need to pitch yourself against the unrealistic beauty standards that social media set before us. In fact, the author suggests that you cut down the clutter on your social media account by hiding or removing the posts that make you self-conscious or feel insecure. Instead, Focus on those that help build you up and boost your self-esteem. Also, invest time in things that help you in the long run, whether it's cooking nutritious food or reading health and happiness-related articles. Part 10, The Lie, There is only one right way to be. We all come from different cultural and ethnic backgrounds. And that's the fun part in life. After all, the world would be a pretty dull place to live in if each and every one of us were precisely the same as everyone else, right? Here, Rachel says that growing up in a white, conservative, Christian small community in her formative years, she was completely unaware of the ethnic diversity that exists in this world, that is, until she made a trip to Disneyland. There, for the first time, she saw guys holding hands, individuals with tattoos, and other people who were extremely different from her. It was then that she realized how protected she had been her whole life. It was an epiphany for her and she enjoyed it immensely. She has since arrived to the conclusion that it is very important to show respect for the distinct histories, ethnic origins, and religious views of other people. You won't be able to enjoy the many amazing things that other people have to give if you don't appreciate the distinct features that each individual has. If you only socialized with individuals who believed and acted exactly the same way as you do, your life would be very dull. 
For example, having friends from different ethnicities has made her realize that people of color suffer distinct obstacles, and as a result, she has been forced to address her own preconceptions and stereotypes. Hence, she suggests that we consciously try to broaden our horizons by adding diversity to our lives, and opening ourselves up to change. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to change your core values or principles, just that you try to live in a community that embraces diversity and change. Part 11, Final Summary Throughout this book, Rachel Hollis reminds us that we only get one shot at life, and we should do everything we can to make the most of it. We should never give up on our dreams, no matter what, and never stop believing in ourselves. We should celebrate life with all its imperfections, and be grateful for what life has given us, and strive to do our best in each situation. Only then can we really become who we were meant to be. Thank you for watching this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe. See you soon in our next episode.